You are watching the next video of the Road to Full Stack Developer Series. I am your host, Franklin, and today we are covering an incredible topic at Code Crafting. We are covering configuration. That being said, there are two disclaimers that I want to mention before we dive in. The first being we are not going to discuss or uncover how to configure Windows operating systems to have Bash and be able to use Bash. We are not also going to cover in-depth configuration of IDEs such as Eclipse or WebStorm or PyCharm or any other really advanced configuration. This is aimed more towards new developers who are probably going to install and download the usage of Visual Studio Code. Also, as a shout out, I'd like to thank Jordan Papaleo, an incredible sensei and mentor to me at my last uh, job at Clear Capital for almost two years. He is an incredible senior engineer who inspired this video with his own repository that he created. I had some notes and some things of how to set up quickly, but I had not had them in anything other than GitHub Gist. And he had actually created an entire repository and I saw his because it was open source and I stole it and made it my own. And now I'm giving it to you so that you can steal it and make it your own and just making it known. So I'll put a link to his GitHub profile below. There you have it. That's our introduction. I hope that this video is very helpful for you. The first thing to bring up is why do we need to have something like a repository for configuration? It's pretty obvious. If you start a new job, you're going to get a new machine and that means you're going to get something with nothing that you use on your personal machine at all on it other than the operating system. And even then, maybe not. Maybe you decide to switch to Mac OS and they're going to give you a nice brand new Mac or an old janky Mac that's used from a developer who they hate. And I don't know, that's just, that's something that you're making the switch to and you don't know how to configure it as quickly as your machine at home. Or maybe you do know how to configure things but you did it through YouTube videos and it was a long time ago and you're starting a new job and you don't wanna think about it all. Or if your system just went down and you had to, perhaps you had a workshop like myself the next day and you needed to borrow uh, the computer of your your significant other or family member and create a user and install everything for your configuration so that you can still do the workshop and not have to worry about it while your other device gets serviced at Apple. This is something very real, very important, and it's also fun. You are going to input your own stuff here. Create your own repository, copy and paste all the files from this repository into it, modify it and perfect it, even make it private if there's some keys via inside of your aliases. And then we are just gonna go over this repository real quickly and we're going to be talking about some specific configurations. Now the configuration repository itself just has setting up your computer, a couple of editor specific configs, but I do want to not take away from this particular directory called project files. These are essentially boilerplates for each of these different projects. One thing that is really cool is the GitHub specific issues. This is an issue template and a pull request template. And these are just quick ways to have templates that are inside of uh, your usage for GitHub, for example, so that whenever somebody goes to actually put in a pull request or put in an issue that you have some kind of structure to it. You'll notice this if you were to go to, for example, GitHub, uh, Facebook's organization page, go to React and try to put in an issue, they would have a template of how they're trying to organize and structure those requests uh, and also provide information. Same for putting a pull request in, what is really being solved, how has it been tested, just giving yourself some, some uh, nice configuration boilerplate that is good boilerplate to be used. What we have in here to start is set up for configuration of your computer. And ideally in this environment, you would install a number of things. On a new machine, you're going to install Homebrew. I usually suggest setting up Homebrew first, I need to switch this, then setting up Bash, uh, because you may actually want to use a different shell. Maybe you don't want to use Bash shell, you want to use Zish shell with Oh My Zish, like in my last video setting up. You might want to install Homebrew first, then install Zish, and then go ahead and do everything in your Zish RC file simply because bash profile uh, file is going to actually become null when you start using Zish. I mentioned that right here as well as some specifics, but in here there is also some stuff 
uh, as far as some basic aliases, for example, alias is using git. This is really cool. Instead of git checkout master, just GCM, it's going to have some aliases. I will also, again, even though it was in the last video, link a uh, link to a GitHub gist that I have public that has a bunch of different commands you can use in the terminal and then a bunch of different aliases, which also includes those git aliases as things you can put in there as default. So that being said, there is the bash homebrew setting up NVM. Now NVM is something that newer developers don't know. They install node because they need to use node package management and they're very confused about what NVM is, or they don't really know what to do when they come across a new project that has a different node version that requires a certain node version to be used for those node modules, etc. And this is a situation where NVM really shines. NVM stands for node version management. And ideally you can switch and swap and have a default of different node versions. And so you can install different node versions and manage them in the command line very easily. And that's something you're probably gonna wanna install and set up as well. As well as setting up Git, of course, for your actual dev environment, you're gonna have to set up Git, which means you're gonna have to have an SSH key uh, and also setting up NPM. Essentially setting up all of those things are you know, their own projects, even the SSH, there are specific ways to just set that up and make that easy. So that is in there. As far as the virtual machine, I do suggest using something like browser stack if you're testing for UI, although that is a cost per month, maybe your employer will pay for it. It just depends on who they are and all the different versions you may be supporting. Uh, as far as free VMs, of course, something like VirtualBox will work fine on this type of operating system. If you do have maybe some excess funds or you've already paid for it, something like Parallel is also great. You can install something like Kali Linux on your machine in a virtual environment of Parallel and mess with it there if you're trying to do some you know, ethical hacking or whatnot. And then you know some suggestions to Flux. I personally think that the biggest dilemma we'll have in about 50 to 60 years is gonna be a lot of people going prematurely blind due to the amount of blue light that they expose their eyes to for long periods of time from such a young age, as we've never really gotten, we've never in society seen long-term negative effects of something like that. And nowadays we have even lenses coming into the world as far as the last three or four years, but even now even more, uh, more investment going into it for special lenses that protect blue light from coming into your eyes. And I suggest this, if you're staying up at 12 o'clock and midnight hits and you're still coding on a really strong blue light and four screen, you're not gonna get as good of sleep. It's gonna be hard to fall asleep. Your eyes are gonna be strained and you're gonna wake up with headaches dry eyes, the whole bit. I've had all of it actually. So Flux is really great. It's free. It'll allow you to set it up and it'll change throughout the day, removing and, and bringing back a blue light depending on the time and location of where you are. So diving into the actual editor configs, we have Atom and Visual Studio Code. For right now, I'm going to focus on Visual Studio Code section. And this would be something that once you've set up Visual Studio Code, you use. The first thing that I usually try to tell somebody to use is actually set up for the shell, the installation of the code command. This will allow you to just be in any part of your directory. For example, if I am uh, in here, I can go ahead and I can type in code dot and this is I'm inside of an actual configuration directory. And so I can open it up in Visual Studio Code very quickly as you can see over here. So that's something that you should probably set up pretty quickly. That way you can find and open up files without using the graphic user interface and use your terminal to uh, have organization and set that up. And that way you can, you know, get to stuff and get it open in your editor very quickly. The other important aspect of your environment, uh, in this case, my environment shown here, although there are additional things and I need to update this to have everything that's in my environment, uh, which might go in its own repository of a private version due to a lot of keys that are in my aliases. But the power of your environment that might persist beyond just installing something is something like snippets. So snippets are a great example of something in Visual Studio Code. Snippets, you can create your own snippets, you can modify these snippets, you can add new snippets, but really snippets are what they sound like. They are putting in a small little prefix, pressing enter, and then Guess what? A bunch of code gets compiled out for you, written out for you. Whenever I create an index.html file, I don't type out an entire index.html file from scratch anymore. I type HTML, enter, and the whole document is created for me just for scratch, for example, there. Or if I'm console logging, I never console log by typing console.log and typing it all out anymore. I type log or I type vlog so I can get 
two and actually have one show label. Uh, or example, for even just arrow ifies or then statements or for loops or whatever you'd want to use for this. Those ones, those snippets can be a little bit more useful, but in something that like I would do in the, in, you know, on average, I create a new component in React and all I type is RCP for a React class component. And that whole thing is listed out, including prop types imported in, in seconds. And it, it will put the arrow cursor wherever you specify in the body of the snippet you're creating uh, via you know how the snippets work. And that way you can actually create a React component in three letters and be already in two places to, with your cursors typing out maybe an internal div as well as the name of the class component, as well as for functional components. I do need to add to here some, some cool snippets for React hooks, but I think that this is something very, very helpful for for example, any lifecycle hook in existing situations like component did update, you should be able to just type CDU and press enter and it creates the whole thing and generates it for you. I do recommend in the very beginning when you were learning, you shouldn't just create snippets for everything, but in some sense, it's kind of cool because if you learn how to write a for loop and you understand why, you should probably create a snippet for it. That way you don't have to always type out that once you understand it. So snippets are very powerful. You should definitely use your own snippets, add these to your existing snippets, find which snippets you would like, create new snippets, Google snippets, just add snippets to your environment. Key bindings are a little bit personal. Uh, I particularly don't even use necessarily these key bindings. I use um, the key, key binding installation of the Atom key binds from, from using Atom. And so I converted a lot of people from Atom to Visual Studio Code, even my own instructors over two and a half years ago to use VSC before it was really big. And that was because you could get everything you could get from, from Atom. It was smoother, it was faster, and there was more promise, more tooling. Atom definitely started coming back and doing some things and people were investing in Atom and there were, you could do snippets and stuff there too. It wasn't like the craziest difference, but Microsoft took the Atom shell which was basically became Electron, and they built their own IDE using GitHub's tooling, right? And, and Microsoft just purchased GitHub. Like obviously they're, they like what's going on and has been going on with GitHub. So that being said, uh, you know, having snippets, having your own key bindings, that's a great thing. Another thing is settings. You're gonna want to have your settings saved here. And the reason why settings are important is there's nothing worse than having to go through all of your individual settings on a new machine and figure out what you had and why that property was there to particularly configure or add something. Uh, you can even see that these settings are kind of a little bit off. And the way that you get to settings is typically by going to preferences and settings and they give you like a graphic user interface and then you have to go through it and select settings.json if you want it. It's more of a like a graphic user interface now, which isn't bad because you can like get to your extensions and stuff, but it is a little bit harder to find things I've noticed uh, if you haven't used it before or if you're used to the fact that settings you suggest pop out as settings.json like this is. So that being said, definitely get your settings in line and save so that you can quickly add your settings to your new machine. And last but not least is extensions. VS Code has tons of extensions. And once you've got all those extensions installed in your machine, you're usually not having to fiddle with them too much unless a new extension comes out or you know you need to disable something because it's giving you issues and you're just like, I don't want to deal with this right now then you might go and mess with your extensions. But ideally on a new machine, you don't wanna to have to go through the extension marketplace, find the extension that you use on your other machine, click download, wait for it to download, and just go through that whole process. You should have all of your, install, your installed extensions in a list so that you can run one command and install all of them. And this way you are pretty much functioning with the settings configured right for your workspace or for your for Visual Studio Code and all of the extensions that you have here, you should be able to quickly be ready to go in VSC with everything that you would normally have, especially if you add your, your snippets globally. So now the quick thing on this is that you can see that there's a lot of extensions here that I don't use and some that I do. This is actually the extensions from Jordan himself. Um, I actually have different extensions. And so if you want to actually get your own extension list, all you have to do is type code space dash dash uh, dash dash list dash extensions and you will get a list of all of the extensions you use and so you can see that there's some stuff that I have installed in here that I don't use like a couple of themes but guides trailing spaces night owl thank you Sarah Drasner 
uh, VS Code icons, Live Server, VS Code, GraphQL, uh, Pola Code is one thing I like to use for getting like little pictures of, of code. All of this is all of the extensions. And so you can take all of this and then add it into your own VSC installs.sh shell command. Uh, and you can just paste them all in there, add code install extension in front of all of them, each and every one of them. And, and there you go, you can just run it in your terminal, shvsc-installs, and right away your whole editor is going to install everything from what you've put in there. So I would say that this is probably one of the biggest time savers if you start a job, uh, especially in UI, right away. This list could be much longer. You might have a lot of extensions. And so just being able to quickly get everything set up in VSC alone is something that could save you hours or I could at least an hour and a half or two hours uh, that you could be reading code on the first day and learning way more so that the next morning you have you have something to talk about with coworkers. So that being said, this is pretty much everything for the configuration repository. Take it, steal it, make it yours. This was not a Visual Studio Code tutorial. There are a lot of powerful tools of Visual Studio Code that I would love to get into, um, but we're not going to get into them in this video. We are, as of right now, we are looking at, uh, you know, essentially just getting everything configured in a short amount of time. Hopefully this was helpful for you. I hope that you have taken everything that we've done in the last videos and applied it to your yourself in some way or another uh, or influenced, I hope it's influenced you for the, for the better. Take the time and set up a, like an entire plan of backup so that you're good to go and so that you don't have to think about this stuff. And all you can focus on is the problems that you need to solve and the code that you need to write. That being said, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.